All right. Well, we're up to 70 folks and it's 8.04. Uh, Andy and Jan, shall we shall we get started? Would you like to go ahead and um, uh, say any words of welcome? Jan, you want to kick it off? Jan, <laughs> uh, I'm switching between screens. I, I hope I've stopped sharing my screen now at this point. Um, good morning, everybody. I, I appreciate your patience with all of us. My name is Jan Santier. I'm the Urban Community Forestry Program Director with the Maine Forest Service, and one of the folks who is help leading this uh, new program that the Maine Forest Service in, in collaboration with the Maine Natural Areas Program has received funding for from the U.S. Forest Service Landscape Scale Restoration Program. And we're really excited to um, offer this training as part of that funding and the subsequent uh, planning and, and uh, financial assistance for, for our invasive plant manager. So um, glad you could all make it and um, really, really excited to get this thing started. So there you go, Andy. Okay, thank you, Jan. Um, yes, welcome everybody. Thank you. Uh, it's been a long time in the making to get this program going, and we're still kind of building it while we're driving it a little bit. But uh, I think there's going to be a lot of good information today. I want to mention that um, credits have been uh, secured uh, both at or at the Bureau of Pesticides Control, also for any uh, licensed arborist, and of course uh, at SAF. Uh, the SAF uh, uh, Category 1 credits for the entire course, which is three days with homework, is 20.5. Um, we'll be sending in the attendance sheets, uh, taking, taking that from the uh, from teams. So um, stick around <laughs> if you want your credits. And with that. OK. Um, the only housekeeping thing that I don't think we we mentioned in the last four or five minutes is just that we have with us uh, Greg Lord of the Maine Forest Service for tech support. And so uh, if you are, are experiencing trouble, uh, feel free to um, chat to Greg in the text uh, in the chat. Uh, he's also available at 287-4950. Uh, uh, again, that's 287-4950 if you're experiencing problems technically. So I guess with that, welcome. And we are so glad, uh, as Jan and Andy said, to be getting this program off the ground. And uh, it has a lot of moving parts, um, and we're still kind of building it, as, as uh, Andy said. So we do promise that your questions will all get answered uh, as we go. And so we're going to dive right in this morning, starting with some invasive plant identification and ecology. And we will uh, slowly but surely make our way through and have space and time for questions. But to cover the meat of uh, what folks need to learn to become plan preparers, we're going to dive right in. Uh, with some invasive plants. So I'm going to share my screen here. Okay. Oops, I'm not at the beginning. Hmm. There we go. So my name is Nancy Olmstead, and I work for the Maine Natural Areas Program as an invasive plant biologist. And I'm pleased today to be joined in this presentation by Rebecca Jacobs, who is the program manager at the Knox Lincoln Soil and Water Conservation District. And Rebecca, if you'd like to unmute yourself and just introduce yourself briefly, that would be lovely. Okay. Can I leave my, I'm going to leave my camera off brief so we can keep moving. Um, so my name is Rebecca Jacobs. I've been working with this Knox Lincoln Soil Water Conservation District for, um, this will be my 13th summer. Um, hard, hard to believe, but uh, I started when my daughter was an infant. So uh, she's 13 and there you have it. Um, and I've been working with invasive plants, um, both in around New England and particularly um, cut my teeth in Massachusetts. Um, so I've uh, unfortunately seen the, the shift from southern New England up through um, southern and mid-coast Maine and uh, I've been working with Nancy and 
on a conservation innovation grant program. This is our second SIG round um, that we're wrapping up this year. So it's six years uh, working directly with Nancy on helping producers get um, invasive plant plans um, here in Knox and Lincoln County. So I'm happy to talk about about six species um, on today's list. Great. Thanks, Rebecca. And uh, yeah, the program that Rebecca mentioned um, funded by the Natural Resources Conservation Service. So uh, without further ado, uh, the first question really when thinking about invasive plants or invasive species in general is just to kind of get to the same page about some definitions. So when we talk about invasive species, uh, or when I talk about invasive species, what, what I mean is a non-native species whose introduction causes economic or environmental harm or harm to human health, and which can establish and spread in minimally managed habitats. So these are plants that are beyond just weedy. Uh, some examples are Japanese knotweed, which you see on the left photograph here, growing in very dense stands along, uh, I believe that this is the Androscoggin River. Uh, so that is an example of an invasive plant. On the right, we have burning bush, which is also called winged euonymus, and that's escaped into the <laughs> forest, and you're seeing the red flush of burning bush leaves in the fall. So it has to not be non-native, it has to cause harm, and it has to be able to establish and spread in minimally managed habitats. And of course, forests are very important minimally managed habitats in Maine, so uh, active um, Actively managed forests are considered natural areas, minimally managed habitats, and unfortunately, we have many invasive plants that can get established there. The good news is that most non-native species are not invasive. So out of every about 100 non-native species introduced to North America, only about 10 become established or naturalized, and those can be weedy but only about one to five plants becomes invasive. So that's beyond weedy. This is uh, you know, in getting into and dominating natural areas. So that's good because we bring a lot of uh, plants for ornamental horticulture and other reasons. So as I said, many of these invasive plants arrive on purpose. 60% in a recent um, study were found to have been brought deliberately only 11% accidentally, and then the balance, uh, the authors could not determine exactly uh, how they arrived. But of the 60% that were brought deliberately, 40% was for horticulture. So uh, this is a very important um, source of invasive plants. 8% uh, for livestock forage, 4% for quote unquote conservation before we realized that native plants could uh, perform those functions probably much better with better outcomes for uh, native species. 7% deliberate, uh, but the authors couldn't find exactly why, 3% medicinal. Um, so many reasons that the plants are brought. And then of course, some of them are accidental introductions. And this uh, plants, typically arrive uh, more than one time. So um, plants are often uh, have multiple introductions independently. So once they come to North America, they can spread by seeds or sometimes fragments. And this is a key way that we can prevent invasive plants from becoming larger problems if we monitor carefully these different routes through which they can uh, become uh, more widespread. So equipment of many types. Um, folks, if I could just remind you to please mute yourself if you're not trying to speak, um, it would be helpful for everyone, I'm sure, not to be distracted by background noise. Thank you. Um, so as I was saying, equipment such as mowing equipment, obviously forestry equipment, um, materials such as uh, haze and mulches, manures, uh, fill and gravel, unfortunately, uh, can also transmit invasive plants um, and uh, water. So in the lower right hand picture here, we, we've got the newly reconstructed uh, culverts, but we also have the movement of water. That's not something that we can typically control, but just something to be aware of when you're on a client's site that has some kind of a river or stream that invasive plants can arrive from upstream. Uh, ornamental horticulture, as noted, is an important um, source of invasive plants and their spread. And finally, our, we ourselves can accidentally uh, spread invasive plants in mud on the boots, attached to pants, attached to pets. So it's always important to do a uh, biosecurity check uh, that includes ticks, um, but also 
uh, plant seeds uh, that could be on your boots or in your pant cuffs, et cetera. So we can prevent these uh, mostly. The water thing is harder to prevent, but uh, if you're having a road reconstructed, uh, you can monitor that site and nip anything that comes in the bud. You can ask for your equipment to be cleaned before it arrives on your property and provide space for that equipment to be cleaned before it leaves your property. Um, you can monitor materials that are brought on. So these are all good practices um, that we encourage. Invasive plants are successful because they thrive on disturbance and because they have competitive advantages. So they're not usually eaten by uh, deer or other browsers and, and grazers. And more importantly, they're not usually eaten by insects and they don't suffer from fungal diseases uh, or other diseases. So uh, this is a huge advantage. Uh, plants spend a lot of energy defending themselves. We don't always think about, you know, plants having behaviors like defense, but they sure do, and it costs resources. Uh, so the fact that these invasive plants don't have their enemies from Asia or Europe or wherever they arrived from, Northern Africa, um, gives them a huge leg up, and they can spend uh, more energy on things like reproduction. Um, because the plants typically come from areas that are uh, different than Maine, warmer than Maine typically, they are able to have early and late leaves, and this also gives them a competitive advantage. So the lack of enemies, the early and late leaf out, uh, this can lead to the abundant reproduction. So that's kind of why they're so successful. The damage that invasive plants can do can be obvious or it can be less obvious. It can be very direct, like this Asiatic bittersweet vine that is girdling these young uh, conifers. So this is a real problem, very obvious to see. On the right-hand side, we've got uh, garlic mustard, and the damage here might not be as obvious. Uh, the garlic mustard is changing the soil fungal communities, those mycorrhizal communities that are so important for many of our native plants. Uh, and so garlic mustard, you know, you see a patch of it and you might uh, not not know what's happening, but there are things that are happening in the soil that uh, make it much more challenging for native plants to get established and grow. And that effect can persist even after you pull the garlic mustard. It doesn't last forever. But um, so just to note that, you know, we don't always know all the impacts of the invasive plants and it's hard to measure things in the soil. So. Uh, for some plants we know because they've been around a long time like garlic mustard and observations have led to hypotheses which have been tested, but for other plants we, we don't know their full uh, suite of impacts and some of them may not be detectable by the naked eye. The big picture on invasive plants is that they displace native plants, native trees, native shrubs, native wildflowers. So in this example we're seeing the flush of shrubby honeysuckle in the understory in the spring. Uh, this is observable every year. Uh, you kind of, I drive around the state and I sort of cringe when I see those uh, shrubby honeysuckle or the burning bush or the Japanese barberry leafing out early, getting those extra photons that are coming through the canopy. Um, this is uh, clearly a very significantly infested uh, area here of young hardwoods. Um, and this is a problem for the long term of this forest, uh, both from forest regeneration perspective, but also for wildlife habitat. Uh, when we don't have the native um, the native plants, um, we don't have the food webs that depend on native plants. And so, you know, we we need native plants uh, for for timber, but we also need them for wildlife uh, and just for sort of the the integrity of the whole food web. A lot of the transfer of energy up to higher levels in the food web happens through insects. And so it, many times what insects need, are native plants. They have pretty tightly associated relationships with native plants. In some cases, um, you know, there are insects like the monarch butterfly that we all know. It, it needs milkweed um, and different uh, bee species or moths or um, flies and other insects. Um, they need specific plants. So uh, when we are having our understories and our edges taken over by invasive plants, we don't have the habitat and the food for beneficial insects that are such an important part of the food web. Um, you know, another aspect is uh, to other kinds of organisms. Um, invasive plants can damage habitat directly for birds. So for example, this is a, this is a salt marsh example on the left, but 
Uh, this is the Phragmites or common reed, this tall grass that you're seeing here invading uh, salt marsh down near Popham Beach. And we have some rare salt marsh bird species that nest in the high marsh. And when the high marsh becomes overrun with Phragmites, it's not suitable for their nesting. So that's just an example of a direct uh, damage to a higher uh, level in the, in the food web. On the right here, you're seeing a, a horrible infestation of hardy kiwi in, in Rockland, Maine. And if you are an uh, arboreal uh, mammal or a bat or um, you know anything that forages up in trees, this clearly doesn't look like normal forest habitat. And uh, you know there's got to be some impacts here in terms of animal behavior and habitat. So. Um, that's kind of the the, the big picture. Uh, again, you know, this is a schematic just showing how insects are in a really important part of our food webs. They allow for energy transfer from plants into fat and protein, which you know feeds small mammals, and the insect bodies feed amphibians, and they feed birds, and they feed omnivores like raccoons. Um, so there's a really important uh, insect step here that relies on healthy native plant communities. So with that, I'm going to turn to identification of invasive plants. I think most of you probably are convinced of the problem of invasive plants. And um, so uh, most of our time this morning, we're going to spend, um, or most of the time in this session this morning, we're going to spend looking at identification rather than uh, discussing impacts. So uh, plant identification requires practice, as everybody probably remembers from your dendrology course or your botany course or just learning on the job. Um, it just takes a while and it takes repeated efforts. Uh, we're going to go outside and look at plants today and tomorrow, and I encourage you to keep doing that. Um, use your free field guide. Everybody should have received a copy in the mail of the Maine Invasive Plants Field Guide. Use the native woody plants booklet um, that's available on the on the resources for foresters and other natural resource professionals page as part of this program. Uh, my very able assistant Maddie compiled that booklet and it's a booklet full of images of native plants that could be confused for invasive plants and tips on how to tell them apart. The Go Botany website, which is hosted by the Native Plant Trust, uh, formerly known as the New England Wildflower Society. Um, it's a fantastic website resource for looking at photographs of plants and also lists many uh, traits of the plant. So if you're staring at a plant and you see that it's got a very hairy stem and you want to know, gee, is that, you know, is that a characteristic of, of purple loosestrife? If it doesn't happen to be in the main invasive plants field guide, you can also check the Go Botany website. Um, and uh, you can download and use some free apps. For example, there's one called New England Wildflowers, which is not just for wildflowers. It also does shrubs. Um, so just a variety of resources to help you uh, practice identifying invasive plants and other plants uh, does require practice. So we're going to go through uh, a number of plants today. And I wanted to say that uh, we're starting this morning. Uh, oh, so... I'm forgetting the order of my things here. So I want to say that we're starting this morning uh, in a minute with uh, plants that are sort of widespread in Maine and um, that are listed on the target uh, invasive plant list for this program. So um, that's how I uh, sort of chose the plants um, for our presentation today. But before that, uh, just a couple of notes on how to use the, the field guide. And um, bear with me, I'm just going to actually grab my field guide. Right, so the main invasive plants field guide is uh, composed of a series of plastic pages and uh, each page is the card for a single species. So in this example here, perennial pepperweed, uh, you've got the common name listed at the top, an alternate common name, perennial pepperwort listed next, the scientific name, Lepidium latifolium, the status in Maine, which for that plant is localized, so it's only found in a handful of known locations. On the top right of the card, uh, there's a color-coded um, uh, word, uh, and it, you know that says it in words for folks who may not be fully color uh, vision enabled. So perennial pepperweed is known to be severely invasive. 
Other plants may have rankings of very invasive or invasiveness un unclear. These are from the advisory list of invasive plants for Maine, a, a lengthy evaluation process that we did a few years ago. And then each card has a series of sections. So there's a description section, which has specific information about uh, you know, the, the leaves, the flowers and fruit, the roots, sometimes the stem, depending on the plant. Um, it's got information on the native range, the, the reproduction, whether it's you know, mostly sexual or uh, by fragments, habitat where the plant is commonly found, similar native species, similar non-native species, and then uh, typically on the next page, uh, control methods, as well as obviously several color photos of each plant. So the plant, uh, the field guide is organized by uh, plant growth form. So at the bottom of the card, you see that the perennial pepperweed falls into the herbs and grasses category. Many of the plants that we're going to be dealing with in the forest fall into the shrubs category or trees. And so uh, they have different colors and different symbols at the bottom of the card. Uh, we also will be talking about some vines. So again, uh, different uh, symbol and color. So you can quickly uh, flip through your field guide and find the section that... Uh, so let's imagine you have a suspicious plant and it's a shrub. So you flip through the field guide and you find the shrub section. The shrub section is a, arranged alphabetically by common name. And so you could just simply flip through, compare your plant to the photographs on the cards. If you think you found a match, then you could drill down into the description characteristics and uh, look at the similar native species and similar non-native species. To compare those, again, you could look those up on GoBotany for photographs and determine whether you've got a match or not. So that's just a couple of thoughts about how to use the main invasive plant field guide. There is a glossary at the back of the field guide if there is terminology in the description section that you are not familiar with. And uh, if you want or need to purchase additional copies of the Maine Invasive Plant Field Guide, those are available on the website of the Maine Natural Areas Program. They're also available at a few local bookstores, uh, COVID-19 permitting. So that's about the field guide. And now, as I said, I want to move into the plants that are on the target list for this program, starting with those that are known to be widespread in Maine. And for our purposes, we uh, said that that was present in at least eight or more counties in Maine. So this is table one on the target invasive plants list. And here we go. So I think Rebecca is going to take this one. Yes, yeah, so first we're starting with Asiatic bittersweet or Celastris orbiculatus. Um, this one is probably widely known to everybody watching. Um, so it is a very thickly woody vine that you can see from the center image strangles the anything in its path essentially um, and can climb as high as 20 or more feet up into a tree. Um, it is not uncommon to have an entire uh, tree line or um, a single tree just kind of encapsulated in the vine. Um, they have distinctly sort of what I would call their obovate leaves, which means they're wider at the tip and narrower at the base. And they have a very distinct tip and um, fairly prominent veining, not as prominent as something like glossy buckthorn, but, but distinctly prominent veining. Um, they, unlike Celastris scandens, which is our native bittersweet um, and only found in southwestern Maine and an isolated region in Skowhegan, um, the Celastris orbiculatus will, um, the A Asiatic will fruit and flower up and down the vine, whereas um, our native is only at the tip. So that's, um, and, and you would know, it's just a very, very vigorous uh, vine. Um, you'll find it along roadsides, um, in farm fields, um, woodlands, um, particularly woodland edges. It gets to be pretty pervasive there. Um, it's spread by birds, so you will find isolated um, stems out in the middle of the forest. Um, and then, of course, once it takes hold, it can spread. It has very distinctly orange roots. When you pull this up, 
um, you will know for sure. There's a lot of sort of wide at the tip, narrow at the base leaves that look somewhat similar, especially if they're small and you're not sure if you pull it out um, at the roots, it, the roots are always very, very bright orange. Um, and another um, thing I like to note is that uh, you can find these as in farm fields sort of growing. If, they're, if it's pre present or prevalent in the farm fields or along the tree lines, look for it going into the, um, the edges or into the fields a little bit because it'll, it, it'll um, be quite persistent. It'll tolerate a lot of mowing. So that's, um, and then of course it's widely uh, noted for its gorgeous berries. It's that orange and crimson combination that uh, has really um, attracted uh, people who like to do wreaths. And so in the um, horticultural slash ornamental decorative world, they have made a great deal of wreaths and then, oh, it's done. It's time to put the Christmas wreaths out. So pitch it into the compost pile and so goes the spread. So, um, so nine out of 10 times or really 10 out of 10 times when you find this, um, it's not gonna be Celastris scandens, it's gonna be Asiatic bittersweet. Great, and next up we have a shrub, autumn olive or Eliagnus umbellata. So this is a shrub meaning multiple stems from the base. On the lower left hand picture here, you can see an example of autumn olive growing in an open field. This is an edge species. It's only moderately shade tolerant. So it likes to grow in the open or along edges or in log landings or along edges of wider roads. It has alternate leaves, uh, which can be kind of variable in shape. So they're all uh, longer than wide, but they can be narrowing to a tip. Or as you see in the right top, photo here, they can be a little bit more blunt at the tip. In the top right photo, you're seeing the tubular four-parted cream-colored flowers of autumn olive, and uh, flower buds are beginning to form now in this species. You can also see in both the top photos that the leaves have these uh, silvery scales on the underside, and uh, you'll also see, if you look closely, uh, some brown scales on the leaves. So that can be quite distinctive uh, when seen, uh, even from a distance in the right light, you'll see that kind of shimmery look to the leaves. These, this plant has uh, alternate leaf arrangement. Um, uh, so does the bittersweet that we just saw, as opposed to opposite or uh, world where the leaves are numerous at a point or opposite like a maple where they're right across from each other. In the lower right hand photo, you're seeing the fruit of autumn olive in the late summer or early fall it develops this uh, orange fruit and uh, people do make fruit leathers and jams and jellies and that sort of thing out of the fruit. Um, it, they are nutritious, um, but they are bird dispersed as well. And so this plant can hop around the landscape. Another thing about this plant is that it's a nitrogen fixing plant. So there are um, associations with, uh, I believe there are bacteria in the roots and the root nodules can capture uh, nitrogen from the air, which is typically inert and break the triple bond between the nitrogen molecules and make it into biologically available forms of nitrogen, which our main soils are often uh, not super high in nitrogen, and so this can create sort of an artificially enhanced environment, um, which can benefit other, other invasive plants. So that's autumn olive. Next up, we have black locust, which is a canopy-sized tree. This is a thorny plant, at least in some times of its life. You can see some examples of thorns on the left here. This is an unusual case of an invasive plant that's native to North America, but native to Southeastern North America. This plant did not naturally arrive here in the Northeast. It was brought um, because the wood is very durable and was used for fence posts and other applications. So this is a plant that's in the, um, the, the legume family. It's got a long compound leaf with numerous oval shaped leaflets and uh, flowers in early summer. It's very fragrant uh, and the flowers are quite abundant many years. 
Uh, they form sort of a dry pod, which is uh, which falls by gravity and can be dispersed in in water or short distances by the wind. Um, this is uh, a species that can form clonal thickets of trees. And the major uh, ecological concern with black locust is for unusual main habitats uh, that are sandy soil habitats. Uh, because this is another nitrogen fixing plant and can get that competitive advantage in those poor soil environments. So, um, you know, we do have calls every year from folks who uh, want to make use of black locust, either because it's attractive for bees, uh, for honey, or because they want to harvest the wood. Um, and so, you know, that all makes sense. Um, but we do consider it an invasive plant and um, one that uh, in many situations, it's advisable to remove. Next up, we have some swallowworts, and I think Rebecca is going to talk more about them. Yeah, so here we have a vine that is um, seemingly at, at first sort of less, you know, it's less obvious perhaps in the landscape. Um, it has much thinner um, stems, sort of grayish, very, very malleable stems. It is that vine that you could quite likely trip over or into through if you're walking, if it's found in a, in a field setting or a woodland edge setting, um, unlike a, a very dense, thick, woody st stem um, or of the vine for Asiatic bittersweet. Um, the most obvious difference in both uh, in black and pale swallowwort is seen in the center because of uh, the, the flower colors. The pale swallowwort is the one on top, surprise, surprise, in that sort of pale pinky peach color and the black swallowwort is that really deep um, purple color in the center. Uh, they have narrow, long pointed tips, um, uh, leaves with pointed tips and uh, here in the mid coast, uh, a particularly black swallowwort I'm seeing um, kind of here, there and everywhere. Um, and it's often found growing up and through a um, multi-floor rows or um, another um, along the edge of a, of a shed or a barn um, and, um, and, and it's sort of mixing in with, with the sort of hedgerow of invasives as it were. Um, and uh, it's uh, got the, the flowers, as you can see, have five tips, five points from, um, on it with a sort of a greenish yellow center. And um, this is one that is becoming, un unfortunately, a little bit more common than, than not. Um, so those are the sort of distinct features is the long, narrow pointed tips. Um, and again, you'll find it. I mean, I found it here on my own property, a uh, black swallowwort growing behind my rhododendron hedge and underneath my deck. So, you know, you're going to find it kind of tucked in um, and it doesn't, it will grow up the trees. Uh, it, it is a vine and, but I'm finding it as much in meadows, field edges, woodland edges rather, and, and uh, growing um, on, on barns and the sides of, of roads as well. So I haven't seen it as much in the woods. Yeah, uh, thanks, Rebecca. I'll just add that um, we would consider this sort of a moderately shade tolerant species, so it can it can go into the woods, um, especially near edges, uh, and it's wind dispersed. So this has a very tiny seed uh, and can also move around in materials like hay. Rebecca is also going to take this one. All right. Uh, Euonymus elatus or winged Euonymus uh, gets its name from the sort of quirky wings or edges on the more mature stems um, that you see in the upper left corner of your screen. Uh, the younger stems in the lower, the tips um, in the lower left corner, you're not seeing those wings um, on the Euonymus. Um, it is, comes in from the um, the nursery trade, it's an, considered an ornamental plant for its beautiful fall foliage. It has fairly inconspicuous, sort of pale, creamy, almost pale green, creamy colored white flowers in the spring. 
Um, and then it, but really it's for the leaves. It's for these long lanceolate leaves that have um, this bright, bright, gorgeous red color. Um, one distinguishing feature I like to find is that they have a um, very sort of teacup shape as an individual species. They have more narrow at the base and much wider at the top. And um, they are commonly that found in uh, both field in, in the woodlands and uh, spreading. And at this stage, just like the lower right hand corner, you'll see that flush of bright limey green in the early spring, um, way before the rest of the, the tree species are, are um, unfurling their leaves. So it's, it's, you know, it's, you drive by it at 50 miles an hour and you're, you don't know if it's necessarily honeysuccle or, or um, you want a miscellino or burning bush, but um, up close, you'll know right away which, which one it is. And again, it doesn't have any competition so it is um, unfortunately be able to spread um, fairly easily. So um, thankfully it is on our list of species that can no longer be sold in the nursery trade, but um, that is the, the, that was the vector, the, the mechanism for purchasing and spreading them along our woodland, you know, into the woodland edges. So that's, you wanna miss the latest. Great. Next up, we have a slightly less common species, but still widespread in Maine, common barberry, which is also known as European barberry, Berberus vulgaris. Uh, we often get questions, you know, aren't there some native barberries? There are no native barberries in New England. Um, there are some native Berberus species in other parts of North America, but not in New England. So common barberry uh, is a shrub that grows uh, in many different kinds of habitats. It can grow in the open. It can also uh, tolerate some shade. And uh, this is just a less common plant than Japanese barberry. And so I'll talk through some of the differences between this plant and Japanese barberry. So this plant typically has leaves that have teeth on the edges, as you can see in the drawing here on the left. Um, whereas Japanese barberry has smooth or entire leaf edges. Uh, you can see the small teeth on the photograph on the right. The common barberry also has a, um, a, a, an inflorescence with numerous flowers, many flowers in the inflorescence, as opposed to Japanese barberry, which has a smaller number of flowers in the inflorescence. Um, someone uh, described the inflorescence of common barberry as being like a lady's earrings. Um, they're kind of large and um, dangly, uh, more showy than those of Japanese barberry. Uh, another difference is that the common barberry often has three spines at each node. So you see that um, this is a, a, a plant with sort of alternate leaf arrangement, so kind of staggered along the stem but multiple leaves at each of those uh, sort of nodes and spines are found at these nodes as well. And so here you're seeing uh, three spines. The number of spines can be variable. So you can find some instances where there's only one spine. But if you look at multiple stems on the plant, you're likely to find at least some stems that have consistently three spines as well as the teeth on the edges of the, of the leaves. Common barberry can sometimes grow in a more upright growth form than Japanese barberry, so that's something also to watch for. Next up, another shrub, common buckthorn. This is a shrub, or it can grow as a small tree on richer sites. In the top left, you're seeing an image of the bark of common buckthorn, which is sort of yellowish, brownish and it has uh, some lenticels, as you can see on the lower right photograph. If you scrape with your penknife the bark of a larger individual of common buckthorn, so maybe greater than an inch or so in diameter, you're gonna find an orange, a bright orange underbark color, so that can be helpful for identification. You're seeing in the lower left uh, the leaf pattern of common buckthorn. This is a species that botanists call sub-opposite or almost opposite. So the leaves are arranged almost opposite one another. 
Um, you might need to look at multiple examples on the twigs. Sometimes it looks like they're all they're they're closer to alternate. Sometimes they look truly opposite. Um, but uh, this one is sort of classified as sub opposite or almost opposite. Uh, in the top right, you're seeing a more of a close up of the leaves. They have small teeth on the edges and the leaf veination is distinct to my eye. It arcs back toward the mid vein, especially toward the tip of the leaf in a way that reminds me of dogwood plants. So if you see in some of these leaves on the top right here, how the veins arc back toward the midrib, um, that's helpful to me for identifying common buckthorn. Similar to the euonymus or burning bush, common buckthorn has small sort of greenish flowers that are pretty inconspicuous in the spring. When pollinated and when mature, they turn into a black juicy fruit uh, in the late summer. Um, so this is another bird dispersed species. And uh, so those fruit are sometimes consumed and the seeds are dispersed. Um, common buckthorn uh, is an emetic. It has a compound called emodin, which is a metabolic byproduct um, that can have a diuretic effect on uh, wildlife but it also is very harmful for amphibians. And so the, the, if there are a lot of common buckthorn growing in an area that has vernal pools, uh, concentration of this chemical emodin in the vernal pool can be high enough that it causes developmental um, uh, dysfunction. And so the tadpoles may not be able to survive the metamorphosis to become adults. And so that has been shown by some research so this is one that um, certainly if there are important ver vernal pools uh, nearby would, would possibly rise to a high level of priority. It's also fairly shade tolerant, um, but it does tend to prefer slightly richer soils. So um, that's uh, something about common buckthorn. Next up, we have common reed. And this is the tall grass that I mentioned will readily invade salt marshes. Uh, this is perhaps only a tangential concern in most um, forested settings and woodlots, but it can be a nuisance species in landings and along access roads. Um, and it can infest uh, inland forested wetlands. Um, so this top right image is a photograph of myself standing along a bad infestation up in the Saboya unit um, of the Bureau of Parks and Lands. Um, so it's not restricted to salt marshes by any means, um, and it will grow kind of in ditches and then escape from there into more forested wetland habitats um, and open wetland habitats. This is a very tall grass, as you can see in this lower right hand image. This is my colleague Don Cameron and um, the, the, the Phragmites australis uh, can grow to be 10 feet tall um, commonly. It has these plumes of seed heads um, that are quite obvious in the late summer and um, that they, they remain standing and sort of a dead tan color um, into the following growing season. There is a native reed species, American reed, Phragmites americanus, which is sporadic in the state. Um, and there are some there are some helpful ways to tell those apart. Um, but if you're if you're standing on a road and you're looking at a log landing or a ditch, um, I would say 99.99% of the time you're looking at the invasive common reed. Um, the American reed is a plant of sort of uh, high quality uh, salt marshes and uh, freshwater edges of great wetlands on the edges of great ponds and those kinds of habitats. Um, so uh, I'm not going to go into the nitty gritty. Um, if you're ever if you ever suspect that you have um, American uh, read, there are some keys on the Go Botany website and feel free to reach out to us for help. Next back to shrubs, we have a, a, again, I would say a somewhat less common shrub. This may be new for some people, February Daphne or Daphne miserium. Excuse me while I take a sip of water. This is a shade tolerant shrub that has escaped um, into the woods. Um, these photographs were taken at a property in Vassalboro, the lower images. Um, the top right image is of the plant in flower in, um, not in February in Maine, but um, pretty early. And uh, I, I don't remember when this photograph was taken. Oh, well, this isn't mine. This is Arthur Haynes' photo. 
uh, but I would say like April or early May. So it does, you know, have this color at a time when um, that's not typical for our landscape. Uh, if pollinated, the uh, fruits develop and they are these uh, reddish orange fruits that occur along the stem. So underneath most or underneath some of the leaves, they're a little bit hidden, um, but um, they also, um, I believe, are, are bird dispersed. The leaves on the February Daphne are, are sort of whorled. So in other words, um, numerous leaves at one point on the stem forming almost like a wheel pattern. Um, you can see some of these here. And uh, the um, plant is also uh, toxic if it's eaten. And uh, the sap of this plant can cause a skin rash in some people. Um, I should note that that's also true for black swallowwort, um, that, that people who are pulling black swallowwort, some people develop um, painful blisters and things on their skin. So um, another reason um, to try to get rid of these. Um, February Daphne is a plant that we know a little bit less about, um, but it's one that we've found in several woodlots um, growing in abundance in the understory, uh, uh, which you know we're, we're concerned about. So it's on our target list. Back to Rebecca, I believe, for garlic mustard. Yeah, so this is an herbaceous plant. It's a biennial herb. In its first year of growth, it creates a basal rosette um, as seen in the lower left corner. Notice that the leaves at this stage are rounded and scalloped. Um, at the and they they look similar to a like a water lily, but just the leaf itself, not obviously the whole, but just that sort of rounded scalloped edge with this little indent at the um, at the stem. Um, in its second year, um, in the upper in the right upper um, in the upper left and the lower right, you can see it um, grows taller. Um, it's got pointed and toothed leaves. Um, it produces a small but, but sh visible white flower with the yellow centers. And it is, uh, when in crushed, the leaves do smell like garlic. And this is actually an edible plant. Um, and then you can see the seed pods in the upper right corner. Um, it averages, you know, in that eight to 24 inch, depending on how much it's being shaded out by, by other plants. I um, unfortunately inherited a patch of garlic mustard on the house we bought two years ago, on the property we bought two years ago with, um, and found it in and amongst um, the sort of wild orange daylilies, if you will. Um, and um, so both of those things have since gone because um, you, there was, it was impossible to separate one from the other. It's super easy to hand pull, um, and but you have to, because of the number, the, the copious amounts of seeds it produces and its biennial nature, um, it's it's a many year process um, of hand pulling to, to get them out of, of the landscape. Um, it is very uh, susceptible to spreading by riparian zones through waterways, through flood zones. So I was really, um, in, well, motivated on multiple levels, one, because I work with them, but two, because I happen to live on a small tributary to um, the Maguntacook River, and I wanted to be sure that it didn't get down the embankment and move along. Um, so again, white flowers, um, early on, they're flowering now um, here in the mid-coast, um, soon thereafter, nor north, and, uh, and they will spread um, quite readily and again make sure you can you and they're harder to note they're easier to note in its second year and harder to note in its first year unless perhaps you're crushing the leaves or you've got a known infestation that you're coming back to because they'll look more like a ground cover um, and they will resemble some other basal rosettes at that stage so the second year it's really easy to get them and um, and then you make note and head back and treat accordingly. We come back to shrubs next for glossy buckthorn, sometimes called glossy false buckthorn. Um, neither of the buckthorns really have much in the way of thorns. Um, the um, glossy buckthorn has nothing that could be considered a thorn. Uh, this is a shrub or a small tree. 
It has uh, alternate leaves, so truly alternate leaves with no teeth. And you can see the veination of the glossy buckthorn is much straighter toward the edge, uh, more like an American beech. Whereas uh, you might recall the common buckthorn had the more arcing leaf veination. Glossy buckthorn is not always glossy. The top right photo is showing some more glossy leaves, but uh, you can find this with a more matte, flat sort of leaf uh, color. The photograph on the left, um, you can see the twig with some white lenticels. So lenticels are typically present on glossy buckthorn twigs and stems. And uh, when pollinated, the glossy buckthorn flowers uh, form fruits, which are first green and then red and then black at maturity. So a single plant can have fruit that are all three colors at the same time, which is uh, sometimes helpful for diagnosing it. The bottom right photo unfortunately shows, uh, you know, dozens of tiny little glossy buckthorn seedlings in a peatland. This is a species that can grow almost anywhere. I find this species in full sun, in full shade, including under hemlock forest, which is a place that otherwise seems pretty resistant to invasive plants. It can grow in wet soil. It can grow in dry soil. It's just a very adaptable plant. This plant is one of the ones that I'm most concerned about in the forest. I have seen densities of glossy buckthorn that are just hideous in forest understories. And I've also seen it sneaky in forest understories, like, oh, there's one over there. And then you walk for another 20 feet and you look to the right and you say, oh, there's one over there. So it's just one of those things that could be easily mistaken for a young cherry or a young birch, but look closer. This has no teeth on the leaf edges and um, it has lenticels. The roots of glossy buckthorn are a burgundy red color. So if you can find a small one and pull it up, you can find that burgundy red color, which is distinctive. And um, the other distinctive, you know, the really distinctive feature is the diverse um, fruit color at the same time. So. Um, if you don't already recognize this plant um, readily, I strongly encourage you to find some examples and train your eyeballs because it's a real bad one in the forest. It's totally shade tolerant. Okay, moving on to Japanese barberry. Japanese barberry is another shade tolerant understory shrub. This is another escapee from planted hedges where it's been used as a living fence because of those spines. This plant has many very small leaves, like probably less than an inch in length, arranged along the stem. It has kind of an arcing habitat habit, like a raspberry or, or a blackberry, and can form very dense stands, which are associated with higher numbers of ticks because the dense stands of barberry, as well as honeysuckle and other understory species like burning bush, have a higher humidity level, and that's beneficial for tick survival. So many reasons why landowners might not want this plant in their forest. The plants can grow to an impressive height under good conditions. This is my colleague, Justin. He's a little taller than I am, and some of these Japanese barberry are taller than he is. Uh, it forms a red tic-tac-like fruit, which hangs under the canes in the, in the mid to late summer. It can be a lot of different colors in the ornamental landscape. So sometimes you see some of that coloration retained in the wild individuals, at least in the fall, but um, typically you just see green foliage uh, most of the time. Onward to Japanese knotweed. Um, this is a plant that you find in many places, including sides of the road, but also can be found in forest openings, old landings, um, places of disturbance. Um, it can spread by seed, but it can also spread by fragments of the root. And so um, both of those can cause a new infestation. Um, the leaves are alternate along the stem and they have this kind of flattened base, uh, which is important when we learn to distinguish it from giant knotweed, uh, which has a heart-shaped base. So that's why I'm kind of strongly pointing this out here, the, the, the sort of more flattened base of the uh, not, uh, Japanese knotweed leaves. 
Right now, in different parts of the state, this plant may still be in the sort of just getting started phase. In this lower left photo, you can see what it looks like as it emerges. I'm sure all the people on this call are familiar with stands of Japanese knotweed, which can be very tall and dense. Uh, and it's a major problem in riparian areas, but it can also be a serious nuisance in forest operations. This is not typically a plant that you find in real um, you know, interior forests, unless you're along a stream or a river. Um, but it can be easily carried by equipment into the forest where it can get started. Um, it is shade tolerant. Next, we go to multiflora rose. Rebecca's going to take this one. Yes, yeah, so multiflora rose is a shrub, um, a very large shrub species, typically, um, especially if it's, well, you can see the upper right corner that's standing in a in a mass of multiflora rose and these are you know grown adults so we're looking at five and a half feet to six feet tall and and these are at least three four feet taller than them so you get a sense of the um the scale there um they have uh opposite leaves up pinnate leaves of course most as most roses as the roses do um they have white flowers in the late spring through the um, summer months with red um, fruits and they are um, clusters of white flowers so very distinctly different than our native roses in flower um, but when you see them in mass or on roadsides um, it's not always easy to tell the difference uh, when you're first figuring, you know, when you're first learning them, or if you see a large stand, you might get the knee jerk reaction to say, oh, no, it's a massive multiflora rose, when in fact, it may just be a lovely mass of, of native roses. So the, the biggest distinguishing feature for our multiflora rose, um, besides the fact that, you know, if it's just this massive tangle and it's growing up the trees, um, is this stipule. So it's in the lower left corner in the, in the red circle. Um, our native roses have smooth stipules, which is the very base of the compound leaf. And in multiflora roses, they are hairy or sort of feathery stipules. And that is, um, it's true for all native roses are smooth and our um, multiflora rose are hairy. So you, if you have any um, question, you can go up to the, the plant at any stage, even when it's small, and you'll be able to know for sure um, if it's not in flower, if in fact it is a multiflora rose. Um, in terms of its and habit, it's you'll often find it uh, roadside edges, woodland edges, but I found it more and more because it's bird dispersed uh, or with forestry practice when you get those openings um, from and uh, gaps of light or and the birds get in there. Um, you'll find isolated patches, even in fairly large um, and intact forested areas. So um, that's something to take a look for, at. Look at. I've found numerous small seedlings or small groupings of multiflora rose um, well into the woodlands. Um, another thing to note is that sometimes they're mistaken as uh, sort of as vines, but they are in fact a true shrub. They just, they're very pendulous, so they have very arching long branches that eight to 10 feet sort of on average if they're, if they're in a shrub form, but if they get close to a tree and they have the opportunity to grow up the tree, um, they can go 15, 20 feet at times. So, um, so that's your multiflora rose. Great, thanks Rebecca. For purposes of time, I'm gonna skip ahead to shrubby honeysuckles and we'll end with this species for today and come back to a couple more that I bypassed. So shrubby honeysuckles are uh, Asian species and these plants uh, were planted for their fragrant flowers. Um, they are opposite leaved plants and the leaves of our several species, we have several species of shrubby honeysuckle in Maine that are invasive. Uh, Lanicera moroii is the most common one, but we also have Lanicera tetarica and they're hybrid. But for our purposes, it's not necessary to identify these two species because they are invasive and they have the same ecological impacts. So um, we can call these Lanicera spa and um, be content with that. If you want to get into the details, um, you can tell them apart when they're in flower. 
but again, they have opposite leaves. Uh, the leaves on these tend to be hairy. When you hold them in your hand, you can feel the, the soft hairs or when you look with the lens. Um, they have a, sort of a shaggy bark. So behind the lower right image of fruits, you can see a, a stem that has sort of the beginnings of some peeling uh, shaggy bark. Um, they are shade tolerant. They will grow abundantly in the understory. This lower left photograph is showing the pulse of flowering in um, early summer and in the understory here. And a helpful character is the hollow stem pith on uh, shrubby invasive honeysuckles. Uh, because we do have some native honeysuckles, most of them are wetland species, but we do have one, uh, the Canada honeysuckle, which can be a common understory shrub in certain sites. But the native honeysuckle species have a solid stem pith, as opposed to the invasive honeysuckles, which have this hollow stem pith. So um, if you have a stem that's larger than your pinky finger and you cut it cleanly with a pair of snips or a sharp knife, you're gonna find some kind of hollow tube. It doesn't always show quite as large as this, um, but it's any kind of hollow chamber in the center and you know that you've got a, a non-native honeysuckle, as long as it's a honeysuckle. Um, again, opposite leaves on this plant um, and the juicy fruits can be red or sometimes orange in the late summer. So uh, with that, we're going to uh, conclude our ID portion for uh, this morning and we're going to move on to our IMAP Invasives boot camp. Great, and so I'm going to... Nancy, a couple of uh, quick questions that came up in the Go for chat. it. Yep. Okay, I, I understand I'm, I'm kind of quiet, but hopefully folks can hear me. So uh, one question was, are there any other invasive plants that ticks are known to be associated with other than barberry? Yeah, great question. So um, the short answer is yes. So uh, honeysuckle and um, uh, I believe multiflora rose also form that kind of arching uh, habit in the understory. And so they can be associated with uh, with ticks as well. Great. And then uh, another quick one is glossy buckthorn known to produce a modin like common buckthorn. Um, I don't know that we know the answer to that question. As so, um, I have not seen research that would indicate that um, the plants are not so closely related as to be placed in the same genus, but they are um, in the same family. So it's possible, but I don't know is the short answer. Okay, thank you. Great. Thanks for it. Great. So um, thanks for your questions. And I wanna say that uh, the purpose of our field site this afternoon is to practice our identification of plants in the field. And obviously that's a much richer and more interesting experience than listening to uh, listening and looking at slides. So we look forward to practicing with you um, as well as doing some uh, IMAP Invasives practice this afternoon.